Huh. Well. That was kind of awkward. Hey, hey, and hey, what's up, and how's it going, all MR beers? I'm so glad that you have took your time to watch this video right here today on the Mick Rock and Bolt Wrestling Review Show. And right now, I'm going to give you my review as well as the results of last night's episode of a very awkward WWE Monday Night Raw. And the reason why I say that is because of how the fans chanted CM Punk throughout the entire show. I have my own thoughts about the whole situation with CM Punk, but that's another video for another time. So let's get right down to this Raw review last night. The show kicked off with Randy Orton uh, coming out and he talked about how the authority is always against him and that he has to uh, complain about being in the e elimination chamber uh, going against five different uh, superstars. And, uh, and he also goes on to say that I'm the only one that matters and that's when Triple H and Stephanie McMahon came out. Of course they're going to come out because they're the guys that... Um, are going to, you know, talk the smack to Randy Orton, uh, basically telling him that we are above you, no one is above the authority, because Triple H has to get his spot on for Monday Night Raw, of course, and uh, b b basically uh, what this was, was um, uh, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon telling Randy Orton to man up, don't bite the hand that feeds you and that you always complain and complain and complain and uh, what we're going to uh, give to you is that we're going to give you um, singles matches with all of the five guys that are in the chamber match and we're going to start with Daniel Bryan tonight which I will get to later on in this review and overall to me that first segment was kind of you know Talking directly to CM Punk without mentioning his name. That's what I got uh, out of that first promo on Monday Night Raw. After that, we saw... Uh, we saw? We saw The Shield <laughs> uh, versus um, Rey Mysterio, Biggie Langston, and Kofi Kingston. And uh, I got, you know, a few things out of this match. One... Uh, you have Biggie Langston, no entrance on TV, so right now it just feels like Biggie Langston is a guy that they have a championship on him, we're not doing anything with him, so we're going to give him no entrance on TV and make him look like crap. But in the same time, throughout this match, I thought it was really enjoyable and how they uh, use Biggie Langston and Roman Reigns in the match. They're both equals and they really feel like guys that um, uh, the fans go over well as both heels uh, and as well as Roman Reigns, uh, I mean, uh, 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 as a both face and heel. And in the same time, Roman Reigns getting some odd cheers every now and then. And uh, also that we saw uh, uh, closing off in the match where Dean Ambrose blind tags Roman Reigns when Roman Reigns was about to end the match and uh, gets the pinfall victory and nails his finishing maneuver. And so there's something going on, you know, with the Shield, of course, you know, they've been teasing this uh, for the past few months now with this possible split. And to me, I have my own theory because uh, Seth Rollins is the guy that's kind of playing the peacemaker. He could be the one that says, I've had enough and I'm going to um, uh, go off on my own. That means Ambrose and uh, Roman Reigns are the only two guys left in the shield. A little twist like that would be interesting, but I think based on just the fan reaction alone, when it comes to... Um, breaking up the shield it's more than likely that they'll have Roman Reigns be the one that breaks out of the shield and have him turn on both Ambrose and Seth Rollins and because uh, Dean Ambrose is the United States champion and he's a guy that to me 
feels like I forget that he is the United States champion because he hasn't defended that championship in so long, and that whole 30-day rule rule is just completely off the rail, and um, so I think they really should do something with that belt. Uh, have Ambrose have a run with the championship, and I hope that they actually throw the belt on him and do something with the belt instead of just having the belt thrown on him. So have him being involved in a feud with Dean Ambrose would be really good. It would benefit his career in the long term as well as Dean Ambrose. And to me, when I look at all three members of the Shield, I think the to me the most successful singles run out of any of the three guys to potentially have a good long run is actually Dean Ambrose because of the way he talks on on the microphone. It's very different. It's very unique, as well as his in ring and psychology move set. So we'll see what happens when they when they do split up the Shield. And uh, after the match, we saw the Wyatt family show up on screen, and I really enjoy the little things. I like that Luke Harper is talking a bit more. I like that he was whistling as well. You know, they were cutting their creepy, eerie promo. Uh, and we all talk about how Bray Wyatt is, you know, the uh, guy that, you know, stands out from the Wyatt family because he is the guy that does most of the talking. And now we got to see, like, like I said, Luke Harper... Uh, talk a little bit more um, up on the screen that, that we saw. And to me, that signalizes that, you know, they're actually, uh, the WWE is giving him a, a little bit more time to talk and that uh, uh, they're establishing Luke Harper a little bit more. So uh, in the long term, it looks good for Luke Harper to see where he goes in his career. As, as well as all three members of the Shield. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how everything in the long term, how it all plays out. But for right now, I like what they're doing uh, with this feud between the Wyatt family and um, uh, the Shield. Because later on, we saw the Wyatt family take on R-Truth, Xavier Woods, and Dolph Ziggler. And, um, and like I said, uh, Lou Carper. Uh, talking a bit more. He was doing most of the in-ring work throughout this match. And um, basically what happened was this was the bureau. Total bureau of Dolph Ziggler. To me, when I was watching this, I was thinking that uh, when um, they had Dolph Ziggler um, uh, about to... Um, uh, get pinned for the 1, 2, 3. R-Truth and Xavier Woods never really done anything at all. And they were like, okay, do we help him? Do we help him? And they were like, you know, we'll just take, you know, uh, you know, a break for, from all this and not help him at all. Uh, to me, uh, this was one of those examples where Dolph Ziggler opened his mouth and he gets uh, the short end of the stick. That's basically <laughs> what I get from it. And, um, uh, with all that beer all aside with Dolph Ziggler treating him like crap, like I said, I like what they're doing with the Y family and the Shield. And after the Y family had their match, they get a little bit of taste of their own ma medicine where you had the Shield show up on screen and you had Dean Ambrose do the old. He was playing a little bit of a Joker gimmick. It was pretty interesting. Like I said, the little, the little things matter. And. As I say that, you notice when the shield showed up on screen that Roman Reigns was the guy in the middle. And usually when the shield cuts their promos up on screen, usually Dean Ambrose is the one in the middle and Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns are the uh, uh, guys on the left and right of Ambrose. So it was to me it was interesting to see Roman Reigns in the middle and have Ambrose on, uh, on the... Uh, right side of the screen and Seth Rollins on the left side of the screen to me that signalizes that they're now concentrating on Roman Reigns he will be the next breakout star also we saw a little Way Barrett segment where he shows up uh, like I said the little things I do like you know the big high riser but the whole Way Barrett gimmick is just pointless to me 
And I'm surprised after three or four years in Wade Barrett's career that he's not a top star uh, as he should be. And the whole Bad News Bear just really doesn't do anything for me. It was basically recycled. As well as going back to the first segment, to me that was recycled as well. And having the whole Wade Barrett thing was just another one of those pointless segments. And then Jerry Lawler interrupted him for some unknown reason and said that we we'll, you may not make it to next week and I'm like okay what did he mean by that and for the love of God I hope it's not Jerry Lawler getting in the ring and having a match with Wade Barrett just don't <laughs> save your life now no don't do it just, just don't okay just don't um, after that we saw a match with Christian versus Jack Swagger uh, to me, this match didn't make sense at all. Uh, even though this was a this wasn't an enjoyable wrestling match, it kind of felt anticlimactic at the end where Christian got the win. But to me, it didn't make sense because Jack Swagger is not in the chamber match. This was a way for Christian to go over. To me, it would make more sense if it was Christian versus Antonio Cesaro to get me excited. To see the Chamber match in uh, in a few weeks' time on uh, pay-per-view because those two guys are actually in the match, and uh, I do have my own theory about Christian uh, when it comes to um, uh, his scenario going into the Elimination Chamber match, which I will save for my prediction video. So watch out for that. But to me, overall, this match was just okay. It was nothing really special, nothing out of the ordinary really happened. And to me, well, as I was watching this, I saw Antonio Cesaro, uh, you know, at ringside with Zeb Coulter. And I think that Antonio Cesaro, to me, should be a breakout star. And putting him in the back with a match where Jack Swagger's evolved, to me, like I said, did not make sense at all. Uh, moving on, we got the Steel Cage match. It was Cody Rhodes and Goldust, the Brotherhood, challenging the New Age Outlaws for the Tag Team Championships inside a Steel Cage, no less. And to me, overall, I didn't notice there was a Steel Cage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, for one thing, they didn't even use a steel cage as a weapon. And that uh, it wasn't a tornado-style match where, you know, you have, you know, guys trying to escape the cage. And uh, to make it feel like a steel cage match. But in the same time, I do like how this match was constructed. How, you know, you had um, these two teams going at it and you have that... One big spot where Cody Rhodes pulls off a moonsault, even though he missed. You know, the other guy has to participate in Cody Rhodes' moonsault. It kind of fell flat. But in the same time, like I said, that moonsault spot was actually actually pretty good in, in itself. Cody Rhodes pulling that off. And, um, and uh, also throughout that match, you know, you saw Road Dog. Uh, uh, to, uh, talking about why, questioning why I'm in this match, why are we in this match, you know, uh, playing the old timers uh, and how they're uh, co complaining about being in the match and, and in the same time while they're wrestling, they go over in the match as good heels, as a good heel tag team and I really like this run they're having with the tag team championships and to me, I would like to see a situation where you have the New Age Outlaws taking on uh, the Usos at WrestleMania, have that old guard feel, and uh, have something where you have them talking about the Usos being the young bucks in, in this match. To me, that would make great storytelling if they do go that route for the tag team division. Moving on, we saw Titus O'Neil go one on one with Zack Ryder. I like the little things. I like Titus O'Neil's uh, new music, his new uh, Titron up on the screen. I do like the little things like that. But to me, as I'm watching this match, I see face things for Titus O'Neil. I like to see him as a good guy, a baby face, even though he did turn on. Someone that signalizes, okay, now we're going to have him heal. Um, 
uh, there's a couple. Uh, there's a few things I like to point out. One is Zack Ryder. Uh, he had his hair changed, his look changed. But to me, you know, Zack Ryder is just one of those guys where he's just used as a stepping stone for guys that want to uh, put a step on their careers to go over. Um, we also saw throughout that match, The Miz came out uh, in his suit, got on the commentary booth and said uh, that Zack Ryder is a guy on the internet. Why is he featured and why I'm not, uh, why uh, I am not on the show? It, it felt real. It, it felt believable. And, and it also came out of nowhere in the same time. So I 50-50 split on that. Uh, as well as um, the whole uh, scenario with Titus O'Neil, I, I was expecting Darren Young to come out to get revenge, but that did not happen. I would have rather, uh, I, I would have liked to see that happen, you know, to um, uh, help Darren Young's career as well as a babyface to help him go over. But uh, I could see why the WWE um, likes Titus O'Neil. Uh, I can understand they have big plans for him. He does have potential. And we'll see where it goes with Titus O'Neil. Also, we saw Fon go and Santino Morel in a dance-off, which turned into a Divas dance-off with Summer Rae and Emma when Santino uh, picked her up from the crowd. And she done this whole dance where she goes, do 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 you know, it's just a gimmick they put on her, you know. Uh, she's from Australia, and I guess, you know, the WWE, you know, decided, you know, you know to throw in this gimmick. I I'm okay. I like uh, how it goes over on NXT, but it's not, you know, going over with the WWE Universe just yet. You know, give it time. You know, it it's something nice for the kids. But, but it's just like, oh, what the heck moment. <laughs> Uh, and to me, you know, I'm all up for comic relief. There's always a place for comic relief on Raw. And when Santina Morella stopped talking, to me, the comedy just went kaput. Moving on, we saw a match between Sheamus versus Curtis Axel. And I thought this match was just boring. Nothing at all excited me in this match. This was a typical Sheamus match where he goes over Curtis Axel. After the match, we saw a little something going on between Sheamus and Ryback. And to me, like I said before, uh, you have to put Sheamus in a match with someone that's in the elimination chamber instead of someone who's not. It would make more sense in that uh, case for you know the whole booking situation when it comes to booking matches on Raw. Also, we saw a promo between Batista and Alberto Del Rio. What happened was was that Batista came out, and before he got to speak, Alberto Del Rio came out, and he uh, and he uh, talked about how those who have unfinished business, and Del Rio went on to say that uh, I've been busting my tail for um, a lot of years now uh, since I debuted in the business, how I've won major championships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and how, uh, Batista has been sitting on the couch for four years, not doing a thing, being in Hollywood and, uh, coming back and winning the Royal Rumble. I do like the argument that Alberto Del Rio makes. And, uh, and, and that's the thing I will point out first because it, it, it's true. Uh, Batista is a guy that does not deserve to be in the Royal Rumble winner. He, he doesn't. He came back for four years, uh, absence, and now he's a part-timer that's going on a full-time basis now for two years, and he wins the Royal Rumble. So, I do like that Alberto Del Rio mentioned that, you know, he's a guy that is a good example of, uh, uh, putting that as an example in a promo. But to me, overall, this promo really fell flat. There was no chemistry at all between uh, Batista and Alberto Del Rio. And what happened was was that uh, Alberto Del Rio tried to cheap shot Batista, and he got one up on Batista. And uh, it's looking like, you know, they're going to have a match at the Elimination Chamber. And to me, it's just a who-cares moment. And uh, like I said, there was no chemistry between these two guys. It really fell flat. 
Uh, I'm not really looking forward to this match at all. It was just meh. N not really good at all. Um, uh, after that, you know, we had that six man match that I already talked about, so I'll move on to another match. It was Naomi versus Hoxana, and we had AJ Lee on commentary, and I do like the little insult she gave to Michael Cole about how to download the WWE app. That, that, that was great. And uh, to me, overall, this was a bathroom break match. Uh, even though Naomi does showcase herself as a legitimate diva, someone who looks credible for the Divas Championship. And like I said, on many of my past videos, we need a new champion right now. The whole AJ Lee as Divas Champion has really fizzled out, and we need to have something going on with Naomi. Put the Divas Championship on her to make the Divas uh, Championship more interesting. That's what I think should happen right now. And, you know, there's also talk about, you know, a, a potential split up with AJ Lee and Tamina, which I'm willing good for because Tamina, I think, should be someone who needs to be showcased as a dominant force as, and an imposing figure instead of being a bodyguard for the champion. That's what I think should happen. And hopefully we'll get that uh, in the weeks to come. Hopefully something does happen with the Divas Division. We had we had that thing with Emma and Summer Rae. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Anyway, moving on to the main event. We had Randy Orton versus Daniel Bryan. To me, easily match of the night. Um, uh, throughout that match, you know, you had Daniel Bryan working on Randy Orton's leg. And to me, Randy, uh, Daniel Bryan was kind of doing heelish things. To me, that was interesting. Uh, you know, because he was working on Randy Orton's leg for at least 15 minutes of the match. And also, Daniel Bryan working on uh, uh, Randy Orton. Uh, uh, and also, Randy Orton working on Daniel Bryan's arm throughout that match as well. You know, it was a balanced match. And um, uh, and uh, to me, Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan work well together. Yeah, there was also that moment where you know Randy Orton caught Daniel Bryan in the in the T-bone suplex, and the way he sold it was really good. He went like ah, you know how how he sold that you know maneuver was actually pretty well. And um, like I said, easily match of the night. Those two work well together, as opposed to Randy Orton taking on guys like The Big Show and Mark Henry. I couldn't imagine if Ry if Randy Orton was taking on Ryback. And uh, to me, Randy Orton doesn't work well with bigger guys because they don't move around, you know, well enough as smaller guys do. And and that's why I think Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton gives great performances when it comes to in-ring work. Those two work very well together. But also in the same time, to me this whole Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan thing kind of ran its course, even for a little bit, you know, even though, you know, we get this match time and time out, it's not like, you know, Randy Orton versus John Cena for the millionth time. Uh, at least they're not giving us, you know, uh, the same Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan match. Every time those two are in the ring, the match feels different. This wasn't the best Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan match that I've seen between these two guys, but it was still really good. And for that reason, I think that um, uh, uh, that overall, uh, this match, um, like I said, was really good. And uh, after that, we saw uh, Kane... Uh, come out, tried to cost Randy, uh, tried to cost Daniel Bryan the match, uh, only to have Daniel Bryan get a clean win on Randy Orton, which is pretty much long overdue considering uh, all the stuff that happened between Daniel Bryan with the one two with the fast one two three count and the uh, low blow, the last time he uh, had a match with Randy Orton, as well as the screw job at Hell in the Cell and SummerSlam, so I like that finally. Daniel Bryan got a clean win over Randy Orton. And after that, uh, Kane and Randy Orton attacked Daniel Bryan two-on-one where 
Kane and Daniel and Randy Orton close out the show. <laughs> I will mention that uh, that the pyro kind of botched in, in a second where Kane done his whole thing and then like there was a delay in his pyro. Uh, I thought the, the to me the, the that was a standout moment to close off Raw. It just felt really awkward. And that's what I felt overall. This show was very awkward. Uh, to me, the WWE needs to get their head in the game right now to make me interested into WrestleMania. The only thing I'm interested in to the road of WrestleMania is the Hall of Fame in inductees to see, okay, who's going to be inducted next? Who's going to be inducted next? Paul Bearer, um, guys from the Hulk Hogan era, the Attitude Era, DX maybe. We'll see what happens with the Hall of Fame, but overall, like I said, this show was very awkward. This was a nothing special kind of raw. It was just okay. There were a lot of uh, bad things that happened on the show, like I mentioned on this review, but there was also some good things that happened. To me, it was a little bit of a below average. I'd give it a, a, around a 5.5 or a 6 out of 10. And uh, to close out this raw review, I will say that this raw review... The more I think about it, the more I think that the WWE needs to do something with the whole CM Punk situation and how they're handling it is okay. But you got to remember, the audience is there to chant for what they want to chant. And if they're going to go too far, they're going to go too far. Understandable. But the whole CM Punk situation, to me... <sighs> It kind of felt disrespectful when uh, you had guys in the ring uh, competing against each other. Like I said, um, the uh, Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton match had CM Punk chance. The uh, Tyrus O'Neill Zack Ryder match had CM Punk chance, as well as the Sheamus and Curtis Axel match, and so forth. There were a lot of CM Punk chance, and I'm surprised that. Um, the CM Punk chants weren't as loud as I expected they were going to be. So, like I said, this was a very awkward show. The whole CM Punk situation, uh, the way did the WWE is handling it is actually not half bad. Uh, but to me, even though I understand the First Amendment rights... It was just disrespectful for the WWE fans to chant a guy's name who walked out on the fans. And, and I don't understand why fans would chant CM Punk when CM Punk walked out on them. It just baffles my mind about the whole CM Punk and how the fans are reacting to CM Punk. They should really open their eyes... And uh, really see the light on the whole CM Punk situation. And like I said, that's another video for another time. So what did you think of WWE Monday Night Raw? Are you excited for the road to WrestleMania or not? Comment below and let me know. And with that said, you can also follow MRB Wrestling Reviews on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. And also you can also comment, rate, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. And to all you viewers watching this review of WWE Monday Night Raw, get plenty of rest and always do your best.